Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to the witnesses. I, I have appreciated my colleagues' questioning. I think they've addressed a lot of the questions I have, and I want to take it in a different direction. I, I would say take it to 30,000 feet. We're talking about a space force, so I should probably call it a low Earth orbit. And talk about problems in space and how we're going to deal with them. And maybe if we talk about problems, then we could work backward to structure. So here's a recent one that I was interested in. Just in the last couple of weeks, March 27th, India announced that it had successfully conducted a test of an anti-satellite weapon. So they had something in low Earth orbit. They used an anti-satellite weapon to knock it down. And it resulted in the estimates right now, 400 pieces of debris, 24 of which are large enough to potentially pose a threat to the International Space Station. Um, there have been other instances like this. There was a Chinese a similar effort in 2007 that led to the cat cataloged 100,000 pieces of debris, many of which are still observing in debris fields that pose danger to other assets in space. There was a collision in 09 between a working U.S. satellite and a, and a sort of defunct Sov Soviet-era satellite that kind of a fender bender that produced debris. And then this debris causes challenges. If we think that space is going to be more of a traffic jam, more satellites for all kinds of purposes up there, what, what should we be thinking about as a Senate um, in this committee or in foreign relations about sort of the rules? What, 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 what should the rules environment be and what should we be doing to try to promote rules? India is an ally. We're not talking about an adversary doing something. We're talking about them testing some capacity, but then that creates challenges for all kinds of uses of space. How should we be solving problems like that? General Hyten, you look like you wanted to jump in. So Senator Kane, uh I think the first lesson from the Indian uh, ASAT uh, is just a simple question of why did they do that? Uh, and the answer should be simple, I think, to all the committee looking at it, is that they did that because they're concerned about threats to their nation from space. Uh, and therefore, they, they feel they have to have a capability to defend themselves in space. And, and can I just interrupt for a second? And, and I think they have a second concern as well, that there's no rules right now. There may one day be rules. And often when we write rules about this, we, we benefit those who already have the technology and say, okay, you already have it. We'll establish rules for you. But then we usually establish non-proliferation rules for everybody who doesn't. So if they're concerned about the weaponization of space, they want to be able to get in there first so that if the rules are created, they, they're sort of grandfathered in. I think that's part of the issue. Well, the, the, the second issue uh, from my perspective is that uh, um, I've advocated for a long time for the development of uh, some kind of international norms of behavior in space. And where those norms of behavior should begin, from my opinion, is with debris. Because I don't want, as the combatant commander responsible for space today, I don't want more debris. Yeah. Uh, uh, but we don't have any international conditions that say that that's uh, not a good thing. And you would think that even our adversaries would have the same concern about the debris effect on their program. So that should be something where there could be some international uh, common ground and ability to find rules of the road. And I think that's how it should be worked in an international perspective to start walking down that that path to make sure that space can be used uh, for future generations. Because if, if we keep creating debris in space, eventually we're going to get to the point where it's very difficult to find a place to launch, very difficult to find a place to put a satellite, to operate a satellite without having to maneuver all the time to keep it away from debris. All those kind of things are, are very complicated, but it has to be worked in an international perspective. and. Uh, I hope we get there. What, what, is the, what is the international forum or what is the international group that could do something like this? So, I'll, I'll continue, uh, yeah. Senator Kane. The, the, the place where that's debated now is in the United Nations and a committee on peaceful uses of outer space. That's mm -hmm. where that is debated mostly. Mm -hmm. uh, and the United Nations is a good place, but I would like to think the United States could take a leadership role in that, working with our allies to define what we believe is, is uh, the proper norms of behavior in space, and then bring that into the broader international community. It's very difficult when you, if you try to work something like this in the broad context, and that's clearly a State Department-led function. Mm -hmm. uh, others in the government will lead that, but from a military perspective, it's important, I think, that we have those structures. I mean, there is some concern that adversaries create debris intentionally, too. If they create debris fields, that can then, you know, uh, prohibit access to 
portions of space. One of the most scintillating federal publications is NASA's debris quarterly. That, that NASA, but, but NASA has an office whose job is to monitor debris so that those of us putting up satellites so we can get serious in our car um, are not going to be affected by that. I mean, so this is an issue that really needs some rules. I think, Secretary Shanahan, you were about to say something. Yeah, I was just going to uh, maybe add on to your comment when you said what are some of the areas that we should be spending more time as a, as a committee or a body. Uh, space is clearly one. Uh, cyber is another one of those domains that needs a, a better rule set. You know, AI and autonomy, all these new technologies are going to unlock <coughs> enormous, you know, very positive capabilities, but there's also a downside, and we need to really be investing time to think about those so we can, to the earlier point, set some rules or establish some norms so that someone doesn't take an advantage or, you know, uh, le leverage. I, I hope we will play a leadership role in that. I think treaties have kind of gone out of fashion in the Senate. We don't ratify treaties much anymore, but uh, treaties are necessary. I mean, the notion that we could just have our own set of rules and a treaty is a bad thing because it involves some incursion into sovereignty. If we don't have some rules about space, it's going to affect our ability. We create a space force like that, and it's perfect. But we find a lot of the domain is a, a domain that we really can't uh, adequately invest in because of debris fields or other things. It's going to be to our detriment. Um, very helpful. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate the witnesses uh, testifying today. I also appreciate uh, from the President and the Secretary and Chairman the uh, $750 billion a DOD request. I hope we can move on that and, uh, you know, appreciate the President putting this idea forward. You can tell that we're all wrestling with it. We're kind of struggling with it. To be honest, it's pretty clear that watching some of your evolutions that you've struggled with it as well and wrestled with it. And I think um, that's okay. That's what this uh, committee is supposed to be trying to address. General Dunford, your, your statement on the fact that reform usually comes after some kind of disaster and we can try to be preemptive or in front of this actually I think is a very powerful one and um, in General Heighton I think what you're talking about saying this is going to happen at some time in the future uh, I think you're probably right about that my questions actually relate to this issue of timing and let me um, give you a concern that I have. It relates to readiness of the entire force. So I commend all of you and everybody else at the Pentagon for working on this readiness. A lot of people forget 2010 to 2016, the Department of Defense budget was cut by 25%, an amount that was almost close to $540 billion, which is an entire DOD budget year. And we all know that Readiness plummeted. I chair the subcommittee on readiness, and we, I've held numerous hearings in readiness in the force plummeted, period. And what we've all been trying to do, and I commend you and the president and everybody else in this committee and the chairman, ranking member, is get the readiness of our five current services back up to the level that the American people expect from all of us and from all of you. That is a hugely important mission. And here's been one of my overriding concerns with regard to the Space Force. Not that it is not important, not that it might not even be a good idea, but I'm concerned that is it prudent to take on what would be a fairly disruptive element of a new aspect of the, fi of the services in the United States military when the current five services, let's face it, are not up to the level of readiness that they need to be. Do any of you think that we are at the level of readiness that we should be right now? General Dunford? General, I'll, I'll start. Uh, no, and, and as you know, each— So isn't that a concern then? I mean, I know you think we can walk and chew gum, but shouldn't we try to get to the level of readiness that we all really think we need and sure. then turn yeah, let me this? Let me tell you how I think about this. I, I don't look at uh, it's either space or readiness. I actually look at making sure that we have a singular focus on the interdependencies of the joint force on space as a readiness issue. 
We can generate all of the squadron and battalion readiness we want, and if we're not capable of defending ourselves in space and taking full advantage of space from a command and control and intelligence surveillance reconnaissance perspective, precision munitions, timing of our systems, if we can't take full advantage of that and we can't protect ourselves in space, battalion and squadron readiness will amount to not. And so I, I view this issue actually from my perspective, which is why my evolution on the issue has, has taken the direction it has, is I actually now have come to much better appreciate as a result of our analytic work the interdependencies on space and the fact that this whole issue of Space Force really is, in my judgment, related to readiness. So in your professional judgment, which I respect immensely, you do not think this is going to take away what I believe is the most important mission everybody here should be doing is getting our five current services back up to the readiness that are demanded by the American people. This, this is, in my judgment, a joint war, whatever direction the committee decides to go, this should be addressed as a joint war fighting readiness issue. That's what it is. It's let me, not an uh, organizational issue. It's a joint war fighting readiness issue. Let me be a little bit more specific as it relates to a readiness concern. This committee and all of you um, have made, all of us together, significant progress with regard to building up our nation's missile defense. And um, Mr. Secretary, you recently said in testimony that was vital. I agree with that. I think the whole committee does. It's been very bipartisan. One of the elements, General Hyten, you have mentioned that's actually critical to our nation's missile defense is having and deploying as soon as possible space-based sensors that can look at both the uh, hypersonics and the ballistic missile threats coming to our nation. I think it's your number one unfunded uh, requirement that you've, put, that you've mentioned that. Again, I think the committee agrees that that's critical. My understanding is that the space sensor layer system is being shifted from MDA, the Missile Defense Agency, to the Space Development Agency, which hasn't even been stood up yet. General Hyten, doesn't something like that almost automatically, in your mind, indicate that we're going to have a delay in deploying a space-based sensor system, which you and others and we all agree is critical to missile defense, when you're taking it out of the Missile Defense Agency into a new agency that hasn't even been stood up yet, how can that help with regard to readiness on missile defense? I'm very concerned about that topic. So I think there's a, a number of interesting observations. Uh, I would say that the uh, secretaries to my right will probably have an interesting perspective on where they live. Where I live as a combatant commander, uh, I have a requirement for a space sensor layer that will see the threats that will enable our deterrent and enable our defense. How quickly that's, can we deploy that? Uh, that's the question. And, and we need that by the mid-2020s. That's what the threat uh, requirements are showing us. And therefore, we have to go fast in order to do that. Uh, I've testified in front of this committee before for that issue. We've pushed that. Um, there's so many people that are involved in space now, it, it makes it difficult. So it was, it was going to be SMC, then the Missile Defense Agency. The Space Development Agency is focused on that. Uh, the structure that needs to be, and the Space Development Agency is supposed to look at evolutionary not, uh, or revolutionary, not evolutionary uh, concepts. Uh, this is a good place for them to do that. They have the right uh, ability to go fast. Uh, but the key from a combatant commander perspective is that's my requirement. I need that requirement, and we need it filled by the middle of the next decade. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> as I understand it, uh, under its current organization, the Air Force does not have a good track record of being able to effectively manage the prioritization of its missions in both air and space. And so space frequently falls to a lower priority or lacks a consistent seat at the table. I contrast this with um, the U.S. Navy, which has successfully managed to prioritize its own air, surface, and submarine missions to include the establishment of separate training, acquisitions, and doctrinal development centers across these very different domains. Why has this been such a problem for the Air Force under its current structure? And what role does a new U.S. Space Command play in helping prioritize space across departments? And how does that differ or duplicate um, the intent of the proposed 
Base Force. Madam Secretary or, or General, do you want to address that? Happy to. Uh, Senator, the biggest shift that we are seeing is the shift from an uncontested domain to a contested domain. Um, over the last three years, inclu right, including the budget that you have before you, this president, the president's budget has included double-digit percentage increases in the budget that are driven by an analysis of the threat, the strategy to meet that threat, the concepts of operations, and the programs to support it. Um, uh, so I think what you're seeing in the difference between what you described with the Navy is that the Navy has been operating in a contested domain for hundreds of years. The Air Force in space has been operating in a contested domain m for a much shorter period of time. We have set up in, uh, uh, the National Space Defense Center. Um, we have schoolhouses and, and specific uh, focus on space, most of which have been set up in the last decade. So you're seeing, uh, you're seeing in, in the Air Force um, that, that focus. And I would also say that uh, for the missions and the requirements of the combatant commander, the United States Air Force has provided what the combatant commanders needed um, in an uncontested environment. So, you know, the Air Force built a glass house before the invention of stones. We now have the invention of stones, and as uh, Jay Raymond said uh, just yesterday to a very large audience, he said a year ago that, that the Air Force was in a 9G turn mm. towards space superiority, and he was wrong. It's a 12G turn, and so I'm proud of the force that we're presenting. So, so how will the U.S. Space Command um, help prioritize across departments, and, and will it, and, and, and how does that differ from intent or, or duplication in terms of the proposed Space Force? I mean, you've you got this very complex system. You're saying you're standing up a new training, and it, you think you're capable, just as, will be just as capable in the Air Force to doing multiple things at once the way the Navy can do it. So how does this differ between, you know, Space Command and, and Space Force? Senator, I was trying to explain why I thought the Navy structures were different from the yeah. way the Air Force eva uh, uh, evolved with respect to space. But in the proposal that's before you, one of the elements that's before you, in addition to uh, there's, there's the, the additive personnel that's in the proposal, some of it is to support the four-star who will be a member of the Joint Chiefs. The other large number of people is to set up a training and doctrine center specifically focused on the challenges of space as a contested domain. So then the Air Force will send your tr people to their training programs? Is that what you're saying, or how does that work? That training and doctrine center would be primarily for members of the Space Force and other officers to get joint experience, and honestly, also our allied officers. The Air Force has already opened up its Space 100, 200, and 300 programs to our allied officers, and we have opened up and created a combined space operations center this last year that includes our allies in California. Okay, thank you. Um, I also serve in the Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation, so I want to talk a bit about the intersection of military and commercial space assets. As you're all aware, this is an area where we don't yet widely ex have accepted norms, and, and we've had that discussion here today already. The multi-prompt proposal we have here would likely increase complications even further in the realm of great power competition, we see countries like China who are rapidly expanding their space presence, but they don't have issues of deconfliction because their military and commercial assets are intermingled and they operate um, uh, almost as a single unit. So how does DOD and the proposed Space Force plan to work with other federal agencies and our commercial sector to deconflict with these issues before and while they are arising? Sir, let me take, take that one on. The Space Development Agency in, in its uh, design is intended to do, uh, uh, really four, undertake four different activities. The, the first is uh, consolidation so that we can take all the requirements of the department. And then to do fundamental systems engineering so that we can take advantage of a space ecosystem. So everything from you know launch to sustainment. And then by design, tap into the commercial space industry where significant innovation has occurred. But for us to actually be able to incorporate that technology, we have to accommodate or make corrections to our acquisition system. Our rules and regulations won't allow us to leverage that new innovation. And the Space Development Agency, which is modeled after the Missile Defense Agency, allows us to be able to take advantage of all of those things. And I think that's what allow us to be able to develop capability more quickly and at a lower cost. 
But I'm also concerned about security and how do you force the civilians to work closely with you in security and share information? You've got people selling tickets for tourism into space for crying out loud. Yeah. How, how do you deconfigure that? Whereas the Chinese don't have these problems because they have total control over their commercial sector. I mean, you know, we have, we have procedures, protocols. We've worked with commercial segments. Of, you know, we have a long, long history of doing that. That's really the intent of standing up an organization like this so we can really leverage that commercial space. I'd love to explore this further, but I'm out of time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator, Senator Tillis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here. I, I want to talk more about uh, organizational transition. Uh, I think the president was right to make this a, a target that we need to achieve. So to me, it's not a matter of whether we should do it. It's how we should do it and when we should do it. Um, Secretary Shanahan or Secretary Wilson, uh, a part of what I'm trying to do is, is when you stand up the force, uh, a part of what you're doing is realigning current operations in a more cohesive unit. And so if you're looking at the end state of a space force, have you done the analysis to determine how much of that is just realigning existing commands, uh, training and doctrine center? In other words, if I'm building a new enterprise, how much of the current enterprise is simply being realigned, and then what is the net new? And what I'm specifically talking about is the underlying cost associated with that, because in reality, you're not going to get a whole lot more money. And so you're going to have to build, you're going to have to create this force within current spending run rates for the most part. And so I'm trying to figure out when General Heighton rightly suggests that there's a capability he needs by the mid-20s, what potentially shifts to the right after we've already quantified that net incremental cost just for the overall structure of a, of a separate force? Sir, the way we've been looking at this is how quickly can we respond to the threat? And then you know, behind all this, how do we do it more effectively? Standing up the space command is not a, a, a incrementally large change in cost. So I would I would argue it's not really moving lines and boxes. It's eliminating uh, overhead and and uh, and competing priorities. So you know, 100% of the time, the space commander can focus on the new mission. It's not about just getting separation from Stratcom. It's 100% focused on the new mission, which is contested space and the the authorities, the uh, rules of engagement, and the TTPs, and the technology to support that. The, uh, the other piece of this was, and this is where the <clears throat> real value is created, in the Space Development Agency for incremental capability that we're going to deploy, given that, and I'll use uh, Secretary Wilson's uh, metaphor, given that we've been designing glass houses, how do we quickly transition so they're, we're no longer building glass houses? That's the race. It's really not about reorganizing for uh, people and professional development. We can pace that based on how much change and cost we want to absorb. But the race to get out of building glass houses is where we've looked at <clears throat> consolidation. How do we go from 10 people attempting to get out of that operation to one and then leveraging the infrastructure? Because we duplicate. And so, right. I, I think this could represent an opportunity for driving out efficiencies and come to find out that maybe there's a way to do this without any net incremental cost. But if, if you don't get that right, then you say the good news is we have a very clear vision for a space force. The bad news is we need net incremental money that we don't have today. And then the bad news we're likely to give you is we don't have any more money. So what are you not going to do? So that's really uh, my focus. Senator, uh, Secretary Wilson. Just to, just to uh, uh, add on here, 90 percent of the forces that we're talking about are currently in the Air Force. In the, uh, the design phase that we're in with the task force that we have stood up that includes all of the services but is led by the Air Force by a two-star general, we are in the design phase now. And one of the tasks in that design phase is to recommend the preliminary macro-organizational design of the U.S. Space Force field units as well as subordinate headquarters. So that planning work is underway. Good. General Hyten, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, I think it's just uh, important um, to emphasize that the Space Force that is in our uh, proposed legislation 
uh, is under the Air Force. Right. So if, if the Space Force existed today, I would be sitting next to the service secretary responsible for space. Uh, that decision by the president and vice president to put the, the Space Force under the Air Force uh, was the, the big driver for me because that will allow us to drive efficiencies and fix problems and not focus on what is the song, yeah. what is the recruiting structure, what is the personnel structure, yeah. what is the basing structure. That when I saw that proposal, I felt a lot more comfortable with the uh, organizational concept. So, you know, that's why I said I don't think it's a matter to the points that General Dunford made in his opening comments. I don't think it's a matter of whether or not we need this focus. It's just... Uh, the organizational construct, and I, and I think that what's been laid out to, to this point is a good one. The, the last thing I'll leave you with, uh, because I want to end on time and deference to my colleagues, is that I still, while we're taking a look at this organizational evolution, um, I still think that we need a lot of work done on the overall organizational evolution of these operations that are now embedded within the service lines that we should really take a look at to drive efficiencies has nothing to do with the space command but there's one best practice for acquisition there's one best practice for a lot of these operations that are now siloed and my guess is if you did that you'd free up a lot of resources within the current spending levels that could actually be uh, made to accelerate a lot of the things that I know are your top priorities. So that's something I look forward to speaking with y'all when we can do it on a more meaningful basis back over at the Pentagon. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for your service. Thank you, Senator Tillis. Uh, Senator Manchins, um, recognize Senator Reed presiding. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you all again for being here. And I'm sorry I've been running back and forth at committee meetings. I do have a few. Um, in the proposal, this, this could be to anybody that would want to answer. In the proposal delivered to Congress, there's a little reference to the reserve component, uh, other than to say that it will be part of the 15,000 people in the Space Force. What staff uh, was told last week at a briefing was that the department was not really sure what the reserve component's role would be until we stood up the active component and that it would take additional legislation uh, to make clear what the role of the Space Force Guard and reserve look like. Uh, if we vote on this Space Force later this year, or in spring, or early summer, whenever, uh, I'm being asked by the Department to vote on a proposal that does not have uh, a real plan for our National Guard or Reserve, which is a big constituency base of mine. So uh, my question would be, if total force is going to be as important to the Space Force as it is to other branches, isn't it important that, that we think critically about the reserve components? Senator, it's impossible for me to imagine a Space Force without a reserve component. We There's have, no plans. I'm saying you're moving without that in part of your plan right now as we see it. I'm very happy to work with you to make that more specific. You all do have it. You can get I'm, more specific with that? I think we're happy to work with you on that. There, there are within the Air Force some uh, particularly guard units that have space. Very much so. I know that. And, and, but I'm saying if you have something, we haven't seen it yet. I'm sorry. But if you could share that with us, it would be very helpful. I can relieve a lot of tension. Yes, Sir General. Senator, if I, if I could just talk about where I think we are. So there's a number of issues. You know, I've looked through this and, and had some of the same concerns you have. There's a number of issues unresolved. And the real question before the committee is, do we stand up the organization and get that four-star leader singularly focused on what the right organizational construct is, or do we wait for the perfect organizational construct to stand it up? And where I felt was to move out uh, and refine as we go, and the committee will have plenty of time to provide oversight. So the initial uh, you know, first uh, step to take in this next fiscal year would be stand up the organization, get the leadership in place, and then begin to address these very important issues, one of which you raised. Okay. Uh, let me go a little bit further. You talk about the culture, this whole new space forces of a culture, right? And you want to diversify it. Well, I can tell you, the Army has a certain culture. The Marines definitely have a certain culture. They're in first. They're going with the guns and blazing. The Air Force, basically, the culture has always been the same. This is where the space professionals have come from. This has basically been your ballywick. How are you going to change that culture when everyone's still going to come from the Air Force? Or what culture do you think to diversify? Uh, Senator, our focus on changing culture is to shift from providing a service to the other combatant, to the combatant commanders with almost like a utility to a warfighting ethos. 
And we're doing that within the space cadre of the Air Force today in the way in which we train our people, the way in which we assign them. Just as one example, um, we, have, uh, we have people who operate satellite systems at Trever Air Force Base in Colorado Springs. They spend four months on the floor operating their satellite sure. systems in a peacetime environment, and then four months in training for a contested environment and how they would operate. Secretary, I'm just having a real, you know, and I think Secretary Shannon and I have talked about, I'm having a real hard time understanding why we need this other agency. You've got everything at your disposal right now. And this doesn't make any, I mean, I'm just having a hard time with it. I'm trying to understand it from, and, and Secretary was very, he was very patient with me trying to explain it. But you've got, if I had everything you all have at your disposal right now, and the Air Force has that expertise, and there's some flaws in it, and you want more attention to it, we'll give you what you need. This doesn't make any sense to me at all. I'm sorry. Secretary, I know you. You want to take another shot at me? <laughs> no, I'm happy to take another shot at it. <laughs> that's why we're, that's why I we're here, I think. Go ahead and give me your spill again, because they might want to hear why you think we need this other agency. Yeah. Um, the very short story is the amount of change that's taking place in this environment we're not prepared to address. The way you're set up now. The way we're set up now. But can't you redirect what you have within the Air Force right now, which is where most of the culture is going to stay? It's not going to go over to the Marines. It's not going to the Army. Yeah. It's staying right over there. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so most of this is really within the Air Force. And as, as Senator Tillis was talking about uh, restructuring, this is a fundamental shift that now treats space as a domain. So the culture is changed because the mission has changed. Okay. The leadership will change. The prioritization of the resources will change. And then our approach to developing capability will change. I got you. That, Let me just, that, if I can lead into this, sure. back to Secretary Wilson. Secretary, you've also publicly stated you didn't think the Space Development Agency is a good use of resources, mm -hmm. citing the Air Force's own Space Rapid Capabilities Office as an effective acquisition body. Can you elaborate on why you think our money and effort is better invested in processes and or organizations that already exist, which is the point I'm trying to make? Senator, the Space Development Agency is not part of the President's proposal or the legislation in front of you. And the, the, the first project that this, uh, that this agency is apparently going to take on is actually funded by the Air Force and is in our budget. It's how do we use low Earth orbit commercially based satellite constellations. Mm -hmm. It's in our budget at $140 million over, over five years and is intended to be It's in your purview budget. also. I mean, that's, that's part of your ballywick. That is, and it's, uh, we propose to do it with DARPA. The question is how best to buy them and whether we need a new, a new agency to do so. Do we need um, a new agency just to get in a lower orbit? I don't think so. Are we justifying a new agency just to get in a lower orbit? Senator, it's, uh, it's, you know, what I'm saying here is not new. My memorandum to the secretary on this yeah. subject has been reported on publicly, okay. and I did not support it. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. On behalf of Thank Chairman Inhofe, uh, Senator Kramer. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thanks to all of you for being here. And I've only been in the Senate for, well, less than four months, but this is the most fascinating two hours so far. So thank you all for being as prepared as you, you are. I'm going to um, summarize a few things I've heard this morning before I run out of time to do that and then ask some questions. Um, General Dunford, you said space is no longer a sanctuary. Uh, I think, Secretary Wilson, you both said uh, it's now contested. Uh, uh, great points, important points. Um, General Hyten, you said there will be a Space Force one day, and I'm going to hone in on that, because we hear a lot of reluctance, a lot of questions about the efficiencies, uh, the business model. You've answered them all brilliantly, not necessarily convincingly maybe to some, um, but I think you've answered those questions v very well. Um, Secretary Shanahan, you said something interesting, and I'm, I want to go through maybe a little history. You said the existing forces are based on a place, on geography. I think it's an important point that sometimes we're missing when, when we draw parallels between this and, and, and other, other efforts and, and missions. As you said that, I started thinking about the Air Force itself. That the Air Force wasn't always the Air Force. It was once the Army Air Force, and prior to that was the Army Air Corps, and prior to that there weren't airplanes that as new domains became 
contested, we had to, to lead. I was also thinking about some other, some other Proverbs, um, including Proverbs, where, where it says that without vision, the people perish. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was a Minnesota Viking fan that said um, uh, the logical conclusion of defense is defeat. <laughs> um, being second is not a great place to be. And I know we're first, but I, I just feel so strongly that if we're going to have a Space Force one day, why wouldn't we start sooner rather than later? Why would we let somebody else get there? And so from a strategic standpoint, um, and, and I guess I'd ask the generals first about this, how important is it to have this this public kitchen table level discussion? I, I appreciate your terminology, um, uh, Secretary Wilson, when you said the president has elevated this topic to a kitchen table level. I think that's exactly right. But our adversaries are watching. They're probably watching this hearing right now. How did how did China and Russia roll out their space? forces or their space activity? Did they do it in a real outward way or did they try to do it under the radar? Maybe the generals could answer that for me. And is it important, by the way, that we send a message? Senator, I, I don't want to be flippant, but the Russian military and the Chinese military are not typically afforded the opportunity we have been afforded this morning uh, in full transparency with initiatives like this. And Senator, the uh, uh, the Chinese and the Russians both look at uh, space as a critical element of their uh, uh, defensive capabilities, uh, as their military. Uh, they've also organized differently about space. The Chinese are integrating a lot of uh, their capabilities into a single command, space, counter space, those into a single command. Uh, they have a, an officer responsible for space, an officer responsible for counter space. Um, I'd be glad to talk to you in a, a different setting about what I think uh, they're doing and what what the strengths of what they're doing and the weaknesses are uh, But I, I really don't want to talk about that in a public forum. I appreciate both answers very much uh, We've had a lot of discussion about um, Cost and benefit and and I you know, I understand the concerns um, of a couple of years or several years of cutbacks that now have us in catch-up mode on readiness and lethalness and all those things that are important and, and I appreciate the, the answer uh, Chairman Dunford, about um, this is part of readiness. This is probably essential to, to readiness. But maybe, Secretary Shanahan, is a cost-benefit analysis, a literal cost-benefit analysis even, is that a possibility here? No, no, it is. And implicit in the uh, Space Development Agency is a cost-benefit analysis. It, it, it's a twofer. More capability sooner at a lower cost. And that's, that's you know, this is about... Uh, moving more quickly. I mean, this is a you know a threat-driven response, and it's really not even a response. As I think what the chairman's been highlighting here is how how do we get ahead of things? The uh, you know, the other piece here, and, and we've touched on it uh, briefly, is we're about to usher in a new age of technology. I mean, this is you know we're on the dawn of a you know some some major changes, and if we adapt. Uh, properly, we'll be able to take advantage of it and, again, increase our, our uh, dominance in space. And maybe just the last question for Secretary Wilson, then, it, 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 with that in mind, I mean, are the increments important? I, 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 appreciate what, um, I appreciate what my colleagues are saying about, but what about, why isn't this in the plan or why isn't that part of the proposal and, you know, whether it's, you know, the Guard or, or reserves or other things. And yet, are, aren't the increments sort of an important part of, the rollout. In other words, we're not we're not going from here to here. We're, we're we see here, but we're going incrementally. Is that not an important part of the strategy? I'm not sure it's incremental. I do think that uh, that what we have now is a set of programs that support a strategy to dominate in space. And you know, we all prefer that space remains peaceful because mm -hmm. everyone loses if war extends into space but we are developing the capabilities to deter and, if necessary, to fight and win in the space domain as we do in all other domains so that our adversaries will choose wisely to deal with our diplomats and not with our warfighters. And that's what this is about. Beautifully said. Thanks to all of you. And I might just wrap up my comments by saying I just don't want to be sitting here four years from now and have four people look at me and go, I wish we would have started this four years ago.
with that, I yield. On behalf of Chairman Inhofe, Senator Shaheen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all very much for being here and for your responses. I, I totally agree with everything that you all said in your opening statements about the, the importance of space, the, the competition for space that we have entered into, space as the next potential battleground. I may even be convinced in the future that we need a new space command. And, and I do appreciate President Trump's focusing on space. I just have questions based on what I've heard and what I understand, and maybe I need to know more, that we have not gotten there in terms of the planning and the commitment, and that rather than spending a lot of time debating and questioning which direction we're going to go, we'd be better to continue to work on that and focus on what we need to immediately to address the challenges that we're facing. So let me, let me begin with that and ask, uh, I share Senator Manchin's concern about the failure to address Guard and Reserve as part of any planning for a, a new Space Command. It's a, a question, as, as you all alluded to, I guess it was you, General Dumford, that our Secretary Wilson, that um, many of our National Guard folks are already doing work in space, and so I think they have a question about what their future role might be in any new space command. So I think answering those questions is going to be very important in order to ensure that there is support from states who control the Guard. Um, but I want to go on to the whole civilian side of this question, because as I understand, um, as space activity increases, as our ability to detect debris improves, and right now, my understanding is that DOD tracks more than 20,000 objects in space, and that number continues to grow, and that we are making investments in situational awareness in space. I had the opportunity to see some of that recently um, to try and track some of that space debris, and that the space policy directive of this administration contemplates a larger role for the Department of Commerce in space situational awareness and space traffic management. We just had a hearing with the Commerce Committee last week where they were talking about reorganizing all of the space elements in the Department of Commerce into the Office of the Secretary. So I I'm trying to figure out which functions would actually go to Commerce and which would stay in DOD and how that responsibility gets sorted out. Senator, I think I can, I can take that one. The Air Force uh, has really since the late 1950s taken on the responsibility of warning people when a piece of debris might hit their satellite. We do that out of Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. You're right that we currently track about 24,000 pieces of debris that are larger than 10 centimeters and we provide that information to every country in the world. We are also uh, expanding our ability to know what is going on in space. Uh, this year, we will go operational with something called the Space Fence out of Kwajalein, which is a space-facing radar, and we will increase the number of pieces of debris that we're tracking to probably over 100,000 with that space fence, and it'll go out to geosynchronous orbit. Um, the shift to the Commerce Department is that they will take over the responsibility of telling commercial companies and deconfliction and, and those things, and we're working very closely with them. Uh, we're happy to transition that responsibility of working on commercial space, on space traffic management, to the Commerce Department. They have had people out working alongside our folks at Vandenberg on how that would probably work. Um, as, the, as the military service, obviously we would continue to have to have space situational awareness and collect the data. We would feed that over likely to the Commerce Department who would combine it with other sources of data and work with industry. And is, would that be the plan in any new space command that's operational? Uh, the, uh, van the concept is that Vandenberg would be part of the space force. Uh, and the Combined Space Operations Center there is where we uh, have all of the services as well as our allies and partners that track space debris. But we would continue to shift the, the collection of that information to the Department of Commerce? Uh, yes, ma'am. General Hyten. So the, that mission today is, is uh, accomplished by airmen in the United States Air Force 
uh, but it's under my command, U.S. Strategic Command. And we provide that data, and we have today 98 uh, space situation awareness sharing agreements with others. Uh, we have to do that because we want to be able to operate safely sure. in space, but it's not a military mission. Now, that's a civil mission, and the Department of Commerce is just taking over that civil responsibility so we can focus on the warfighting market. But I, I met with Secretary Ross this week. Uh, he's not going to try to build all of the data and the sensors that we have in order to do that. He'll take our sensors and all our data, and he will just become the face to the, to the commercial sector and the face of the world so the military doesn't have to do that. But that function that's in STRATCOM will transition to the SPACECOM. And so will the personnel who are currently working at STRATCOM transition to the part Department of Commerce? Is that the plan? Uh, no, ma'am. The Department of Commerce will, will have that front-facing piece, uh, the, the airmen of the United States Air Force today that would be in the space force in the future working for the Space Command, they still have to do that mission so we can do our defense of mission and our space control missions in the future. That's why we started doing that. We just fell into the space traffic management business. We do it for defense. No, I'm, I'm just concerned about the expertise that might be required in the Department of Commerce, and are they going to have to hire that new? Are they going to take we're, it from the Air Force? We're working very close with them to understand what kind of personnel requirements they would have to have, how they would do that. Um, in the conversations I had with Secretary Ross this week, what I pointed out is that if we do it right, most of the capabilities they need can actually be automated and, and acquired through commercial agreements. So they wouldn't have to have this army of people doing that. Uh, they could do it a whole lot better if we do it right from the beginning, and we're working closely with them to make sure we do it as efficiently as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On behalf of Chairman Inhofe, Senator Blackburn, please. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank each of you for being here Today, and I want to thank you for the time that you've spent individually uh, with us. I may be the outlier on this panel, but I totally appreciate why you need to have a Space Force. I, I get it. You know, when you look at technological advancement, when you look at 5G that is coming on, you look at the cyber pressures, you look at... Uh, that lower orbit uh, component, when you look at the integration that is taking place in the new space economy, I fully understand why you need to make this a priority and why you need to focus on this, why we as a nation need to focus on this, because 21st century warfare is most likely, from what I understand, going to be a good bit different than what we have seen in times past. So I appreciate that um, we are putting an emphasis on this so that we're not left and caught flat-footed at some point when we need to respond. Uh, Secretary Wilson, I want to say all good wishes as you leave. It's... Um, it truly is an honor to have you here, and we appreciate the work you've done, whether you were wearing the uniform or in the house or um, here. And, of course, I thoroughly enjoyed serving in the house and on energy and commerce with the secretary, and I know because of that expertise, you do have an understanding of the commercial side and also of... Um, the military side, it is a unique perspective. Um, one of the things I do want to come to, and um, Secretary Shanahan and I discussed this a little bit, as you look at this new space economy that is growing, and um, Senator Duckworth talked a little bit about the Chinese, and of course we've discussed this. You don't know where their commercial sector and their military sector end and begin because they're one and the same. And that is a great power competition. And we want to make certain that we are focused on what that means. So are we doing enough to encourage and leverage the dynamism of the commercial space industry so that we are going to be able as we conduct this transition to meet our national security needs. And uh, Secretary Shanahan, I want to hear from you briefly on that. And then since we are near the end of this hearing, 
I would like to just go down the dais. Anything that you all want to add that you haven't had the opportunity to add? Secretary, do you first? Sure. Thank you. I, th I think we're in a unique opportunity, given that now we have to design and deliver <laughs> capability that's more resilient, that we can draw in the advances the commercial space industry has developed. I mean, I think that's, that's this unique point in time. That's why it's so important that when we do the development and the acquisition, we, we start at a different place than where we are today with our acquisition system. And there, there are two big opportunities. One is we systems engineer the ecosystem to draw in launch, to draw in the ground segment, to draw in 5G. It's not about how do we procure a, a microsatellite or a, a CubeSat. It's how do we design this system so we can ingest large volumes of data that we're going to take. With a focus on interoperability Correct. and cross-platform. Yes. And integration of all the different the the different agencies that come under DOD. No, absolutely. And we and we'll we'll benefit. I think that is a very important point. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Secretary Wilson, anything to add? Senator, with respect to uh, architectural design, the Air Force has just finished a 90-day study looking at different, uh, uh, different, uh, looking at the threat, um, looking at uh, the phases of conflict, looking at all of our missions, and calculating and doing about several thousand iterations of war games to figure out what are the best architectures and how do we get there fastest to a defendable space. There are a few conclusions from that. One is that different missions require different solutions, um, that an increase in number of satellites, particularly large number of commercial satellites, helps, but numbers alone are not enough to prevail. Um, it, we also found that, uh, that uh, the congressional direction to consolidate all of space communications under the Air Force is actually a tremendous step forward, and I can explain in classified session why that would be. And then the, uh, the space missions that are not well aligned with commercial low Earth orbit satellite systems should probably stay where they are, possibly with changes in protection, um, but that, that using only commercial space so putting hundreds of small, cheap satellites into orbit mean, uh, does not work as Got a strategy. It. And, uh, and it would mean that in combat, that low Earth orbit system would be quite vulnerable and would fail. So this is a complex problem. Uh, we've done some pretty good war gaming, and we will be happy to come up and brief the committee at their convenience. Appreciate it. General Hyten, anything to add? Um, Senator, I'll just say uh, it's all about the threat. How do we stay ahead of the threat? Uh, the threat right now, especially in China, is going much faster than we are. Uh, we have a significant advantage over them, but that's the advantage of, of history and what we've built over the last few years. We have to stay ahead of them. And I, I just thank this committee, uh, thank the Congress for, for taking on the threat. When it comes right down to it, that's General what General Dunford. About. Senator, the only thing I'd say in the interest of time would be that, you know, we really have two choices. Uh, either have a bias for action now and move out and establish an organization knowing that there's many questions to be answered or wait until we have all the questions answered before we stand up the organization. And, and my best military advice, given the importance of space and the consequences of not doing all we can to optimize the department to move forward in space, would be move out now with, with might, what might be the 80 percent solution, refine as we go, and the committee will have, a, will have an opportunity to provide oversight to address some of the issues that have been raised this morning. Thank you for the service. Uh, thank you. On behalf of Chairman Inhofe, Senator Heinrich, please. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Reed. Um, I guess first I, I just want to say as somebody who's Ranking Member right now on Strategic Forces and sits on Intel and obviously sits on this committee, and as somebody who has uh, oftentimes fought the Pentagon over the last decade about the value of disaggregated space architecture and, and, and rapid capabilities, I, I really appreciate the focus we have on space right now. I think it is, it is welcome. There are disagreements on, um, uh, on 
or at least some skepticism about this construct at this point. Um, but I think all of us can agree that uh, this is a conversation that's been coming for a long time and we need to have it. I want to pivot from Space Force real quick to um, Space Development Agency for a minute and just ask Secretary Shanahan and General Dunford. Um, one of the my concerns there is that we aren't simply shifting money and missions around to do what we're already doing at places like Space Rapid Capabilities Office, Air Force Research Labs, SMC, and some of the things that are are working under the current construct. So just what assurances can you provide um, that, uh, that we're not reinventing the wheel, but we're adding value? No, I think there are two domains or, or two capabilities that the department is going to invest in in its modernization. And it has to do with command and control and communications and then earth observation. Each of the services has its own plan. So it's really more about the systems engineering and the architecture rather than the technology that's being developed at the, at the RCO. We do need to, when we look across all of the, the labs, start to make decisions on uh, what are the standards we want to employ? Not necessarily uh, direct technology development, but how do we develop standards so integration becomes more seamless and less costly? Yeah, I, I w would not disagree. And I think uh, as we're looking at this, I think there's some real value in, in looking at co-locating uh, the new SDA with some of the existing ecosystem so that we get those economies to scale. Uh, General Dunford, do you have anything to add to the Secretary's comments there? The only, thing, the only thing I'd say, Senator, is, I mean, this makes sense to me as an initial step, and I think the broader question you're asking about is how do we make sure that all the processes in the department are aligned? Right. And, uh, and that's going to be, you know, the responsibility of all of us to ruthlessly drive alignment over time, ruthlessly drive efficiencies over time, and get this thing moving and make the refinements that I know are going to come. It's probably only one thing I'm 100 percent confident of as I sit here this morning, and that is, Five years from now, it's going to look slightly different than it does today, or what we propose today. Great, Secretary. I want to I want to talk a little bit about NRO. Um, obviously, it, a lot of exposure to that on on one of my other committee assignments, and they have a pretty unique role right now, both under Title Fifty and under Title Ten, and and I think they're working well. Can can you give some certainty around is is NRO in or out of the White House legislative proposal right now, and what's the, the logic? Uh, it's, it's out, right. and it's, it's not out because there aren't it's, uh, an enormous synergies. Mm -hmm. it, it's really out because of uh, organization and you know, agreement on timing and alignment. There, there are a lot of details. This is General Dunford's point about you know, how, how quickly can you move. We can move out on the things we can control. It doesn't mean that we couldn't move out in the integration with NRO. To your earlier point around architectures and technology, as we build out the future, we need to be provisioning with the NRO because that integration is going to take place in the future. And if we do that, it makes the integration that much easier in the future. I think that's probably the right answer. I know there are some questions on this committee about where that belongs, but I, I think that's the right approach. Um, Secretary Wilson, General Hyten, I wanted to ask you, um, I know we talked before about um, the importance of leveraging small space and commercial assets, and last week you spoke about blackjack, but I, I'm more interested in the, the issue around giving small launch providers an opportunity to put some of these small sats uh, in place. Uh, does this space proposal do anything more to leverage the that emerging um, industry to meet our national security objectives and is there a place where is that is that one place where sda might also play a role uh senator the the, uh, the air force is responsible for for launch but as you know we don't build rockets we buy launches right. um the the biggest challenge is on the heavy end but on the light end we have a, a variety of things that we're doing and, and general Hyten may be able to add to this some but um uh, we have contracted for example with with uh with virgin galactic to to launch off of the uh 
off the, under the wing of a 747. Um, we, uh, we are working with a number of very small, very innovative companies on different ways to launch and launch flexibility and reconstitution from unexpected places is one of the ways in which we keep our adversaries guessing. General. And Senator, we've, we've made a lot of progress in the last few years of taking advantage of that. I think one of the strengths of the proposal that's before you, though, is the structure we're proposing will allow us to better leverage all of the industry that uh, this country has to offer. And, and we've struggled a little bit with the commercial sector in, in particular. We've struggled with the smaller mm -hmm. companies figuring out how to do that. Right. Uh, the Air Force recently has, has made huge progress in walking down that path. I think Space Development Agency can walk down to real commercial leverage. So I think the, the total of this proposal really gets after a lot of the things you're talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. On um, behalf of Chairman Inhofe, Senator Hawley, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you uh, for to the witnesses uh, for being here. Thank you for your uh, work, your diligent work on this important proposal and this important topic. Uh, you've uh, nearly made it to the end here. Uh, so uh, just six minutes to go. I, I want to ask you um, about a few, a few specific challenges. We talked a lot this morning about the space domain, the importance of the space domain in general. Let me ask you about some of the challenges, as I understand them, that make the space domain important. And you can tell me if my understanding needs revision. One of the major issues, as I understand it, that makes space so important is our global C4 ISR uh, architecture that runs through space, uh, sort of the central nervous system of the joint force. Uh, we were able to build that central nervous system in and through space in years past because it was largely uncontested. Uh, space. But now, as you've said over and over today, it's contested, it's congested, it's competitive. And so our C4 ISR and uh, precision navigation timing networks are at risk. So what I want to ask you is, what are we doing to make our global C4 ISR networks and our P&T networks uh, more resilient and survivable? And how does the Space Force, how will a Space Force contribute to that? Absolutely. Go ahead, General. So, Senator, the... Uh uh, I think you described the space challenge uh, quite well. I think we have a significant uh, element of everything that we do that goes through space. There's not a single military operation that exists on this planet that doesn't involve space some way, and the, and the C4 network that we operate yeah. leverages space, especially because we operate away from oh. our homeland. We operate yeah. overseas, mm -hmm. and when you do that, you need to bring your communications, Wait. bring your ISR, bring all those capabilities with you, and a significant amount of those capabilities today come from space. And so as we look to the future, uh, we have to make sure we protect that, and we defend that, and we can still provide those capabilities. Uh, and our adversaries have seen that too, and as they've seen that, they're developing capabilities to counter those. So we have to adjust. We have to be able to de fair. build different yeah. architectures that, that we can fight with more effectively, that can guarantee that capability is always there. We have to build the ability to defend ourselves yeah. and the ability to deny an adversary the use of space at a time and place of our choosing if we have to. Can you? Uh, as the Secretary discussed yeah. earlier, we don't want conflict to go into space, but if it does, we have to. In, in this setting, um, General, can, can you give us some idea about what are some of the steps that we are taking now or that need to be taken to make that infrastructure, that C4 infrastructure um, architecture uh, and our P&T architecture uh, m more resilient. I mean, what, what, are, what, are the, what I'm driving at is, I think you could see is, what are the specific things we need to be doing to meet this very pressing challenge? And then how does that tie into this large structure, structural change uh, that you've been proposing here today? So the, uh, the secretary described one of the big changes uh, is the integration of satellite communications in one place. Uh, as we move to a Space Command and a Space Force, the, the benefits that we'll get from that uh, unity of effort will be we'll have one command focused on operating satellite communications, and we'll have one force look, looking at uh, acquiring the capabilities we need to. And, and the integration of those two capabilities will allow us to better defend ourselves and operate in the future. You can apply that to uh, position navigation and timing. You can apply that to overhead uh, weather. Uh, 
if you uh, uh, and since you're Miss a warning, you know, all the capabilities we have, you that apply okay? that same yeah. concept. Yeah. And we can talk I really, in a really classified session about the Thank specifics you. of what we're doing, but Blumenthal's in what? broad terms, that's, yeah, that's the structure. Okay. Madam Secretary, you want to add to this? Senator, before the uh, fiscal year 19 budget that we brought up before, uh, before your election, um, we did some work on what should our strategies be and how do we shift our programs to implement those strategies. And we did a tabletop exercise with many of the members of the committee to show what the strategies were in the program shifts. Those strategies really are kind of revolve around five things in general. The first is to protect and defend. So defend our satellites, think chaff and flares, but other kinds, of, uh, other kinds of things. And it's different mission by mission. Second, be able to stop an attack. It's not good enough to stand in the ring and, and dodge and weave and take punches. You need to be able to swing back. Third, proliferate. Now, proliferation alone does not solve the problem, but it does complicate the problem for an adversary. Fourth, undermine the confidence of the adversary that they really understand what's going on around them. And fifth, all of this rely, uh, rests on a foundation of excellence in our people. So those are the five lines of effort, and they're all supported by programs and programmatic change that was supported by the committee in the FY19 budget. Thank you. That, that's very helpful. Um, I, I think that you know, my set of questions around uh, your proposal for this major structural change for the standing up of a, of a Space Force relates to this line of questioning. I mean, is it what are the specific pressing challenges we face in that domain, and will this new structure help us meet those specific challenges, uh, or, or is there a danger that we're too focused on the domain as a domain, and we're not focusing enough on the specific challenges? Let, Mr. Secretary, uh, before my time expires, let me just ask you a, a somewhat related question. The relevance of AI and new technologies, you touched on this briefly, I think, with Senator Kramer, but uh, tell us something about how Space Force may help us help the, the, the whole, the joint force, yeah. uh, continue to develop the new uh, technologies, whether it's AI or otherwise, that we need uh, to be leaders uh, here in the 21st century. Right, so the Space Development Agency in our modernization for the National Defense Strategy addresses building an integrated transport layer for the Department of Defense so that we can ingest and move significant volumes of data that facilitate artificial intelligence. It's this build out of the broader infrastructure that also includes the ground network that'll connect sensor and shooter and then all other de decision makers. It's not just about the closing the fire control loop, but we're trying to scale and address latency. And this is the need, this is why we need fundamental systems engineering as we approach this, this problem set. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. On behalf of Chairman Enhoff, Senator Blumenthal, please. Thank, thank you, uh, Senator Reid. Uh, thank you all for being here today, and thank you for your service. Uh, you know, I've been in and out as I've attended other committee hearings, and I sort of feel like um, the most important facts for us and the American people to understand are the facts that haven't been said today. And the reason why they haven't been said is that they are largely classified. And the reason that's important is that the American people have no idea, really no idea, about the immensity of the threat in space. And I've made this comment in a classified setting that I wish the American people could be present in this room, not this room, but the SCIF, because our adversaries know what they are doing. We know what they are doing. They know we know what they are doing. But the American people have no idea. And so this discussion and debate will have very little interest in the American public. It's carried on in a level of, forgive me, bureaucratic language that most Americans would have trouble seeing an immediacy in their daily lives. But if they were 
privy to what we hear, and you know it much better than we do because you live it, I think they'd be pretty alarmed. Uh, and I, this is not by way of criticism of you because you're living with the strictures of what is classified and not, but uh, I think we have a, a real obligation to explain to the American people why space is a domain that matters, why the threats there are real and urgent, why they are growing in importance. So I think we all agree here that's, that space is an important domain. Um, undersea warfare is an important domain, but we don't have a separate demand for it. Cyber is an important domain, as my colleague uh, and friend, the late John McCain, used to say. Uh, and so I found very persuasive, Secretary Wilson, what you said in July of 2017. I know it's been quoted to you before this morning, um, and, and others of you, the reasons for your opposition to that separate um, domain or the separate command uh, for the space domain. Um, but I would like to ask, in terms of the the personnel issues that I think are of um, immediate concern to a lot of folks, um, this proposal would exempt space, space Force civilian personnel from Title V rules and protections it would create a new accepted service that is separate from the federal government competitive service or a senior executive service. It would create an alarming precedent, I think, that uh, potentially could erode the merit-based civil service within the Pentagon and eliminate the rights of Space Force employees uh, to participate in collective bargaining, for example. There's currently no civilian workforce that is statutorily exempt from collective bargaining rights. Can you tell me, uh, Secretary Shanahan, why that is a part of your proposal? The uh, uh, Title V that you were uh, referencing was based on the discussion we were having earlier around integration with the NRO. That's the, the model that they employ there, and as we th think about the uh, talent management practices that we'll need in the future. We wanted to provision for that. Much like in your uh, you know, reference to the uh, undersea domain, our approach to systems engineering is the same as the you know, Navy's undertaken. So there are a lot of examples that we're trying to draw from that have been successful. That was, that was the nature of, of that insertion. Would there be protection for whistleblowers in the same way there is throughout the rest of the government? The, uh, the baseline that we're coming off of is the existing uh, personnel system. This was to incorporate, you know, in, um, the ability to integrate with the NRO. So I would, you know, I'd have to go back, sir, I'd have to go back and, and confirm that for you. But I If you would, that would yeah. be appreciated. You bet. Um, because uh, based on this proposal, the Secretary of Defense could terminate any Space Force employee, quote, in the interests of the United States, end quote, and as drafted, it says notwithstanding any other law, which leads me to think that they would be exempted from a lot of other protections of law and could simply be dismissed yeah. whenever you determine it's in the interests right. of the United States. Yeah, let me, let me go back and confirm that that's not our interpretation. Um, my time has expired. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, but Thank I you. think there are essentially, uh, and I have a lot more, and I'm going to submit them for the record, a lot more questions than answers here. And as uh, others have remarked, um, each of you has raised objections or reservations or questions in the past, the very recent past, about this idea, which uh, I'm not sure have been fully addressed here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on behalf of Chairman Inhofe, Senator Warren, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we're here today to examine a proposal to set up a space force within the Air Force. 
And before we haul off and authorize spending billions of dollars on this, I just want to ask a couple of questions about what problem this Space Force is supposed to solve. So let me start with you, Chairman Dunford. Is it correct to say the Department of Defense has proposed a Space Force because the U.S. is at risk of losing its competitive advantage in space and our space assets, including critical asset, uh, satellites, are becoming increasingly vulnerable. Is that a fair statement? That is, that is a fair statement, Senator. And, and just a quick caveat based on your opening comment, in the organization that we have today is an organization that we built when space was... No, I understand space. that. I understand that. So I want to think about, though, what the basis of the problem is then. A 2016 GAO report that examined our existing space acquisition programs noted, quote, we and others have reported for over two decades that fragmentation and overlap have contributed to program delays and cancellations, cost increases, and inefficient operations, end quote. Secretary Shanahan, is it the DOD's view that unifying space programs under a single service will address these problems? Uh, Senator, unifying and aligning certain programs under the Space Development Agency will address that problem that you spoke to. So you say the problems of delays and cancellations, cost increases, and inefficient operations will be solved if there is a separate branch of the military but still under the command of the Air Force. You know, this is particularly surprising to me since the proposal to leave the Space Force headquartered under the Air Force would still leave exactly one person responsible for acquiring hardware for both the Space Force and the Air Force. So it's not clear to me how this solves anything. In fact, it's hard to see how that person would be able to balance the competing needs of both services without a massive increase in overall spending. So Secretary Shanahan, let me ask, obviously DOD has not been able to solve the problems identified by the GAO over the last 20 years. Why do you think another layer of bureaucracy will suddenly solve this problem? Well, I think the department solved a lot of problems. I think we can point to a lot of programs where inefficiencies, uh, delays in decisions, uh, redundancies, overlaps have, have been corrected. I think there's a... Well, it's, uh, I'm sorry, the report is from 2016 from the GAO saying you have not solved these problems. I'm, and all I'm uh, arguing is we've made lots of improvements and we can, we can point to... And how is having one person, as you have now, in charge of the acquisitions for these two programs, space program and the Air Force, how's that going to solve the problems that were identified by the GAO? Well, uh, specifically, there are a set of fragmented programs today that will be consolidated, and they'll allow us to get at many of the issues identified in the GAO report. Th there's just one person in charge right now. This, and you still haven't fixed yeah, this problem. Yeah. No, this isn't about one person. This is about an organization, an organization that has certain capabilities and, and decision rights. Well... Look, I understand that DOD says that unifying space acquisitions is going to help improve outcomes, but I'm concerned that it won't because program delays and cancellations, cost increases, and inefficient operations are the rule, not the exception. And the entire defense acquisition system already has this problem, and nothing in this proposal makes it any better. You know, none of the ideas I've heard today clearly spell out how a Space Force leads to improved security in space. Instead, all I see is how a new Space Force will create one more organization to ask Congress for money. And there's no reason to believe that adding an entirely new Space Force bureaucracy and pouring buckets more money into it is going to reduce our overall vulnerability in space. I just think the taxpayers deserve better than this. I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Warner. On behalf of uh, Chairman Inhofe, let me thank the witnesses for their testimony and uh, declare that the hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.